أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون يا أيها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحدة وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والأرحام إن الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم أعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما أما بعد فإن أصدق الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار All perfect praise is due to Allah the Almighty I testify that none is worthy of worship but Allah and I testify that Muhammad is his final prophet and messenger May Allah exalt his mention as well as, as, well as that of his families and all his companions We will start a series of three or four sessions on the rulings or on rulings on fasting and related matters. Fasting in general and certain matters that are related to Ramadan in particular. Uh, let us start with the definition of Siyam, fasting in uh, in two aspects. Linguistically, in the Arabic language, Siyam refers to abstinence, refraining from any matter, be it talking, eating, drinking. To abstain from something is the literal linguistic meaning of the word. Now, in Islamic terminology, in Sharia, Siyam has a, a different uh, or a more detailed definition. It is the abstinence of food, drink, and sexual intercourse with one's spouse from dawn until sunset with the intention being in, in the person's heart or mind prior to the, cr the crack of dawn. So, it contains three parts. Number one, the abstinence itself from food, drink, and sexual intercourse. Number two, the period, the duration is from the crack of dawn until sunset. And thirdly, it is having the intention prior to the crack of dawn. If any of these is violated, the fast is invalid. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam touching upon the, the uh, spiritual aspect of Siyam and in Ramadan in particular given a virtue of fasting during Ramadan he said and this narration is mentioned in the books of Imam Ahmad and An Nasai and Shaykh Al-Albani Rahmatullah Alayhi ruled it to be an authentic narration uh, and it was narrated by Abu Hurairah he said, whoever fasts Ramadan, two conditions, whoever fasts Ramadan, imanan wahtisaban, out of faith, belief, that it's something that Allah ordained, 
That's number one. Iman. Wahtisaban. And hoping for the reward from Allah Azza wa Jal. Now meeting these two conditions results in غُفِرَ لَهُ مَا تَقَدَّمَ مِن ذَنْبِهِ All his prior sins will be forgiven. You reset the counter, you start from again. You start from zero again. So the virtue of fasting Ramadan with full faith, sincere faith, firm belief that Allah Azza wa Jal ordained it, and hoping for the reward from Allah Azza wa Jal will result in the expiation of all the person's prior sins. Now, Allah Azza wa Jal, knowing the nature of mankind, He often orders, gives encouragement, and on the other hand, warns. So, you always see the command and then encouragements. To do it, you get this. When you do it, you get that. Right? But on the other hand, you see, if you don't do it, this will be the result. This is the consequence of negligence. What is the consequence of negligence with regards to Ramadan? The Prophet وسلم, this is mentioned in the books of Ibn Hibban and An-Nasa'i and ruled as authentic by Shaykh Al-Albani and narrated by uh, Abu Umam Al-Bahili radiallahu anhu. The Prophet وسلم, once was narrating uh, a dream he saw and dreams for the, for the Prophet وسلم, was one of the forms of revelation. And he said a long dream during which he وسلم, was exposed to different types of punishments for different sins people commit. In that narration he said, so the two angels took me and they, we passed by people who were hanging by their hamstrings and their mouths were torn and blood was pouring out of their mouths. So he said, so I inquired from the angels, who are these people? The angels replied, these are people who fast but break their fast short to sunset. Shaykh al-Albani comments on this narration saying, if this is the punishment, Allah Azza wa Jal is threatening those who actually fasted the entire day but came short to completing it and they ate or drank or had inter uh, intercourse with the spouse prior to sunset. They are threatened with this type of punishment. He said, if this is that type of punishment for them, how would the punishment, how would the severity of the punishment be for those who never fasted from the beginning of the day? How would the punishment be for those who neglected the commandment of Allah Azza wa Jal, who broke the second pillar of Islam or the third pillar of Islam? Fasting. Because fasting is one of the five pillars of Islam. As in the narration by Ibn Umar, that is reported in Bukhari and Muslim, by Bukhari and Muslim. Islam was established on five and then the third thing he mentioned and in another narration it was the fourth. It alternated with another one which is zakah. He mentioned fasting. If that was the punishment for someone who simply broke his fast early, how would it be for the one who never fasts? who never intended the fast. He knew Ramadan is coming and he never had it in his mind to say, Inshallah, I'm going to fast. I seek the reward of Allah. I want to expiate my sins. I want my sins to be forgiven. forgiven. How would the case be with someone like this? We seek refuge in Allah Azza wa Jal from his punishment. And Imam al-Dhahabi said, whoever refrains from fasting during Ramadan without a legitimate excuse is worse than one who commits zina and who is an al alcoholic. He said he is worse than that and scholars consider him to be a non-believer. It's a serious matter to neglect siyam during Ramadan without a legitimate excuse. How is the month or how do people confirm that the month has started and the month has concluded? 
How do we decide that? Well, the Prophet وسلم, informs us that. It is in Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Abu Hurairah anhu. He said, fast upon seeing it or sighting it, and break your fast upon sighting it, meaning the crescent. So, we are commanded by Muhammad وسلم, to start our fast upon sighting the crescent. Upon the conclusion of the month of Sha'ban, and sighting that new crescent, we will start. So what if the crescent, for some reason, the moon can't be seen? The Prophet ﷺ tells us. He said, but if you can't, due to clouds, you couldn't see it. Then complete the count of Sha'ban, 30 days. Now notice something here, which comes as a response to those who say, well, Mathematically and due to calculations, no one will be able to see it. The Prophet ﷺ never spoke about it not being born or it being born. As a matter of fact, being covered with clouds proves that it is there, right? But we couldn't see it. So the point, the basis over which we decide the initiation of the new month, which is the month of Ramadan, is the actual sighting of the moon with the bare eye, with the naked eye. If we couldn't, then we will complete Ramadan, uh, Sha'ban 30, and likewise for the conclusion of Ramadan and the beginning of Shawwal. What are the pillars of fasting? Fasting has two main pillars. Number one, to abstain from all things that nullify and invalidate one's fast from the crack of dawn until sunset. And number two is the intention, having the intention prior to the crack of dawn. It can be done from the night before. Now, uh, the scholar said, there are different things by which one is considered having had the intention to fast. Number one is to actually remember it. Number two is to intend to have the pre-dawn meal, which is suhoor, or to intend from night, the night before, to say, inshallah, tomorrow I'm going to refrain from all invalidations of siyam. Things of the sort. All of these things are considered to be uh, sufficient for one to haven't had the uh, intention. طيب. What if someone goes to sleep after Maghrib and he oversleeps? A very exhausting day or he was on a journey, right? Prior to Ramadan and announced, Ramadan was announced the next day and he had just arrived, right? And prayed Maghrib and Isha and slept. And did not intend that night. And he woke up at Fajr. Not having that intention equals an invalid day. That day is not going to be counted for him. He must make it up. But he must, out of glorification for the month of Ramadan, he must refrain from eating and drinking as well. What type of people are ordered and commanded to fast Ramadan? The following preconditions must be met before it becoming mandatory about someone or upon someone to fast. Number one, he must be a Muslim. So a non-Muslim is not required. It's not accepted. He must be sane. He must be uh, at the age of puberty. He must be wealth, health. Well, health-wise, he must be sound, and he, was, he must be at residence. And for women, they must be out the, the period of the monthly period, menstruation period, or the postpartum bleeding period. Otherwise, fasting is not valid for them. They're not allowed to fast. These are the types or the preconditions of, uh, that must be met before it becomes mandatory upon someone to fast. Uh, what if a 
parent decides to make his son or daughter who haven't reached yet the age of puberty, he decides to make them fast out of training. Well, it is accepted and it's rather recommended and encouraged as a form of training for them. So when they grow to the age where they're commanded, then they find it much easier than those who would start training at the age of puberty. Uh, Rabi' bin Muawwad, may Allah be pleased with her, said when uh, before the, the command to fast Ramadan was revealed, uh, the Muslims were commanded to fast Ashura as an obligation. So she said, we used to make our kids fast and whenever they got hungry, we would give them a stuffed animal, what we know today as a stuffed animal made out of wool. So we would keep them quiet, make them forget the fasting or the hunger they're, fa they're suffering from until sunset and then we would give them food. You need to notice that a child who would become quiet with a stuffed animal is really young. So they used to train them from a very young age to fast because an eight-year-old or a nine-year-old wouldn't really be uh, moved by a, a stuffed animal. It wouldn't uh, attract his attention, you know. So they, com the companions were keen on training their children, raising this generation upon piety and attaining piety, which, was, which is one of the main objectives of uh, fasting Ramadan and fasting in general. Types of people who are exempted from fasting and do not have to make up for the days they break the fast, but must pay ransom in return for every day they break the fast. There are different classes of people that fall under this category. Number one is an old person who cannot fast, male or female, and this is the opinion of the Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu. A person who is sick and whose cure is not hoped for, chronically ill, and there is no hope for him to be treated. So there is no hope for him to later make up for the fast. He will continuously remain ill, so he can't fast forever. So that is incapable because Allah Azza wa Jal conditioned that with capability. And Ibn Taymiyyah rahmatullah said, obligations are waived when there is incapability in performing them. I give an example here. We are commanded to stand up during the mandatory five daily prayers. And if someone sits without an excuse, his salah is invalid, correct? But he's allowed to sit when he's ill. So that obligation of standing up during salah is waived because of an excuse, a legitimate excuse. Why? He's incapable. There is a hindrance that prevented him from fulfilling this obligation. Likewise, if someone is ill and will continuously remain ill, then he'll never be able to fast because his health simply does not allow him. So that's another uh, category or class of people. Based on that, the t contemporary scholar said, anyone whose job is extremely difficult and will not be able to fast whilst working, and he will always be having this job because it's his only source of provision, then he is also, also ruled as the one prior to that, the one with a continuous excuse, legitimate excuse not to fast. Number four and number five are related to women, a pregnant woman and a breastfeeding woman who fear for either their health or the baby's health or the fetus in, in the pregnancy, then they're allowed to uh, not to fast and pay ransom feeding a poor or a needy person rather for every day. And this is the opinion of Ibn Umar, Abdullah ibn Umar and Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu anhuma. Now, the condition for this concession to be given to these classes of people is real incapability, real hardship that cannot be tolerated by normal people. 
And it's not just exhaustion, a bit tired, ah, I'm, I don't feel very good when if I fat. No, it has to be a legitimate excuse, a real hardship that cannot be tolerated and harm is expected as a result of fasting for any of these classes of people if they do fast. Now, this ransom that must be paid in form of food is equivalent to about 750 grams of rice. Anas radiallahu anhu, when he grew older and he became unable to fast, he used to gather 30 poor or needy people and feed them one meal altogether to make up for the 30 days he couldn't fast during Ramadan. This is uh, a narration that was ruled as authentic by Sheikh uh, Al-Albani rahmatullahi. Now, who's exempted from fasting but must make up? The first one is exempted and does not have to pay uh, to make up but must pay a ransom. This one is a class who is exempted from fasting, who is given the concession not to fast, to break his fast, but must make up for the missed days. It is a person who is traveling and a person who is ill. And this illness is judged, as the scholars said, based on one of the two following uh, categories or conditions. It's either judged by a doctor, a physician, a medical doctor that is, or prior experience, the person knows that he is ill in this type of illness, he's got this type of disease, and he knows that in previous years when I try to fast, I couldn't. Some people when they catch a cold, they can't do anything, right? So, if he catches a cold, he simply cannot fast. He must be on treatment. Others might catch a cold and have infections and a runny nose, you name it, right? But they still can tolerate fasting and life goes on very well. So it's either by a physician telling you, no, you're not allowed, or you yourself having prior experience based on which you decide, no, I can't fast if I am ill. Now, what is better for a person who is uh, traveling? Is it to break his fast and take up this concession? Or to fast and refrain from taking the concession and applying it and enjoying it? Well, there is a difference of opinion between the scholars. It's a controversial issue. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said, it is up to the person, if he sees that he is strong enough and he can fast, then he may fast. If he sees that he is weak and fasting during travel will weaken him and could subject him to harm, then he needs to refrain. As a matter of fact, there is a narration that is mentioned in the book of Imam Muslim. Hamza al-Aslami radiallahu anhu asked the Prophet sallallahu this particular question. He said, I see in myself strength. Should I fast or should I take the concession? He said, if you feel that you're strong enough and you can fast, then go ahead. So it's up to the person. When would a person who is intending to travel, when can he actually break the fast during Ramadan? Then the scholar said, if he is, if he mounts the means of travel, if it's the car and he starts traveling or the plane, then he may break the fast then. Now, any type of travel would suffice. Can, can someone travel for any purpose and still say there is a concession and I'm going to go ahead and break my fast? No. Scholars said it must be a travel to a lawful purpose. So someone who's going to gamble, for example, right or other prohibited reasons of travel is not allowed to enjoy this concession because he's going on a impermissible and impermissible type of travel so 
he is punished by not being allowed to enjoy this concession. The third type of people who are commanded to break the fast and must make up. So we mentioned two who are allowed to break. This one, this type is commanded. It is haram to fast during Ramadan for this type of, or this class of people, but must make up. It is only for women who are in their monthly period or in the postpartum bleeding. They are commanded not to fast. It is haram for a woman in such a period or in such a situation to fast, but she must be, she must uh, make up for these missed days after Ramadan, after the bleeding stops. Now, even if she starts bleeding seconds before the sun sets, that day is invalid and she must make it up. There are days that Islam legislated them being prohibited for fasting. We can't fast during them. We will just select some of them. The two days of Eid, as the Prophet Sallallahu said, and it's narrated by Umar radiallahu anhu, reported by Abu Dawood and Sheikh Al-Albani rahmatullah alayhi ruled it to be an authentic narration. The Prophet sallallahu forbade fasting during these two days. The day of Eid al-Fitr and the day of Eid al-Adha. Another type of fasting or another fasting that's prohibited is to fast the day of doubt. People are doubting whether tomorrow is Ramadan or not. You're not allowed to fast that day unless it coincides with Fasting that you're usually used to do. For example, it coincides with a Thursday or a Monday, and you're used to fasting Mondays and Thursdays, right? In this case, this does not apply to you. Okay? Another type of fasting that is prohibited is continuous consecutive fasting without breaking it with the fast breaking meal or the pre dawn meal, without eating at all, continuing. Day and night, day and night, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited that type of uh, fasting. Next, we will come to the etiquettes of uh, fasting. Number one is having the pre-dawn meal, the suhoor meal, because the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as in the books of Imam and Bukhari and Muslim, uh, narrated by Anas, he said, eat the pre-dawn meal. Tasahharu. Eat the pre-dawn meal. فَإِنَّ السُّحُورَ بَرَكَةِ فَإِنَّ السُّحُورَ بَرَكَةِ In another narration, فَإِنَّ فِي السُّحُورِ بَرَكَةِ Because there is blessings in the meal of, in the pre-dawn meal of suhoor. Should I eat rice and chicken and meat and bread and salad and have a jar of, no, no, no. So, what would suffice as suhoor? The Prophet ﷺ said, eat anything, and if you can't, at least take a drink of water. So the minimum you can do is have a drink of water. But what is the best type of suhoor? The Prophet ﷺ said, the best type of food for suhoor is dates. To have a date, or to have dates, depends on how hungry you are, right? Is the best type of food you can take as suhoor. When is the best time to have suhoor? Don't have suhoor after taraweeh and go to sleep and wake up for fajr. No, no. The best type, the best time for suhoor is shortly before the crack of dawn, before the adhan of fajr, as was the practice of the Prophet wasallam. What if someone is eating and he's doubting whether or not it's time for salah. Well, a man came to Ibn Abbas and told him, I eat. When I start doubting that it's time for salah, I refrain. He said, no, don't refrain. Eat until you're certain that it's time for salah. Now this might not apply to our times. We have the calendar with the timetable 
and we have the adhan, whether in the radio or in the masajid. MashaAllah, we live in a Muslim country. Allah has blessed us. Alhamdulillah, we live in a Muslim, we live in a Muslim country and we hear the adhan from multiple of masajid, not just one single masjid. So I don't think anyone would be in doubt whether or not it's time for salah unless he's deaf. Then he needs to have sign language and have someone uh, tell him that, inform him that uh, it's time for salah. The Prophet ﷺ encouraged us to break the fast with either ripe dates. If you don't have it, then dried dates. If you don't have it, then please take a sip of water to break, to break your fast with. Another etiquette is to supplicate. Now supplication during uh, the day or whilst one is fasting is recommended and encouraged. And the Prophet ﷺ told us that the fasting person has his supplications responded to and answered throughout his fasting. But upon breaking the fast, that particular time, there is also a supplication that will not be rejected by Allah Azza wa Jal. So it is recommended that as soon as you break the fast to supplicate Allah Azza wa Jal. And in the times we live in, let us try to remember our brothers and sisters who are suffering throughout the world. Next is to refrain from anything that goes against the objective of fasting. Fasting is meant to be a training. It's meant to achieve piety. It's meant to achieve Allah consciousness. So stay away from anything that violates this. Fighting, shouting, bad mouthing, cheating, so on and so forth. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us that fasting is not only meant to refrain from food and drink and sexual desire. He said, alayhi salatu wasalam, perhaps a fasting person will get nothing out of his fasting but thirst and hunger. This means he did not benefit from that fasting that he's done. Why? Because he did not refrain from other things besides food and drink and sexual desires. Lastly is the use of siwak, the tooth stick. It is recommended, the Prophet ﷺ, recommended the use of siwak in all times. And it doesn't matter if it's in the beginning of the day, in the middle of the day, or prior to sunset, one is recommended to use siwak throughout the day. Things that are permissible during fasting. Number one is to immerse yourself, to dip yourself in water, whether it's, it's swimming or taking a shower. The Prophet ﷺ Abu Bakr ibn Abdul Rahman said, I, I saw the Prophet Sallallahu whilst fasting, pouring water over his head to cool himself down. It's very hot. So you can take a shower if it's very hot. And it's worth mentioning that this year we're approaching Ramadan and it's going to be a very long Ramadan and it's going to be a very hot and humid Ramadan. And I see this to be one of the blessings from Allah Azza wa Jal. It's one of the favors from Allah Azza wa Jal upon us. Why? Because we got we to gotta fast. There's no escape, right? But it's going to be difficult. And the Prophet ﷺ told Aisha, إِنَّمَا الْأَجْرُ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ الْمَشَقَّةِ You get rewarded equivalent to the hardship you go through. So there is no way we can say we're not going to fast, so we must fast. But Allah Azza wa decreed that it's going to be in a long, hot summer. So we thank Allah Azza wa Jal. And we need to think positive of this aspect of the heat and humidity and the link. We are given a longer period to supplicate and supplications are not rejected. They responded and answered by Allah. What more of a blessing can be there? Subhanallah. So we thank Allah Azza wa Jal for this bounty on top of the bounty of Ramadan. It is permitted to use eye drops, ear drops, and kuhl. Uh, the Prophet وسلم, as per the narration by Aisha, reported by Ibn Majah and Shaykh al-Albani ruled it to be authentic. She said the Prophet ﷺ used kuhl whilst he was fasting. Kissing, hugging, 
embracing one's spouse, for those who are married, of course. Bachelors, we skip this point for you, but for us married people, this is something, but it is condition. The condition is that one must be able to control himself and not go after that. Go beyond hugging and kissing and touching the spouse. Umar radiallahu anhu came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And he said, oh messenger of Allah, I am ruined. He said, what ruined you? What destroyed you? He said, I kissed my wife during the day whilst I was fasting. He said, don't you perform wudu? He said, yes. He said, don't you rinse your mouth? He said, yes. He said, do you see anything wrong with that whilst fasting? He said, no. He said, so why are you asking? Meaning, there is also nothing wrong with kissing and hugging your wife whilst fasting. Now, Ibn al-Qayyim said, the resemblance between the two, why did the Prophet ﷺ talk to him about rinsing the mouth during wudu whilst fasting as an answer to him asking about the kiss? He said, because if one exaggerates and is not careful when he's rinsing his mouth, he can swallow water and thus invalidate his fast. Likewise, if you kiss and stop and don't exaggerate to the point where you go beyond that and invalidate your fast by having a sexual intercourse, then it's also all right and there's no problem with it. Taking shots and injections, uh, non-nutritious ones, of course. Sheikh Al-Uthaymeen also permitted inhalers for those who are asthmatic. Uh, eye drops, ear drops, and suppositories uh, as well. And he said, none of that invalidates uh, the fast. Cupping during Ramadan, it's a controversial issue. But the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as mentioned in the book of Imam Al-Bukhari, uh, had cupping done to him whilst he was fasting. Rinse in the mouth and the nose, as per the uh, prior narration, is also permitted. Provided one is careful not to exaggerate, as the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam told uh, Laqit ibn uh, Sabura, he said, "Rinse your mouth and nose, but don't exaggerate when you're fasting." Things that cannot be avoided, like one is is walking and then is, uh, the wind blows dust and he swallows the dust or something like that, uh, then there is nothing wrong uh, with that. Tasting the food for those who are cooking, uh, but I don't mean eating. Okay, it's just tasting it with the tip of the tongue and then spitting that afterwards. Don't say, I heard uh, in, a lex in a lesson that you can taste the food, so I'm just tasting the food, right? And you eat half of the pot. No, that's not what's intended here. Just take it on the tip of the tongue to make sure the spices are right, the salt is all right, right? So if you have a picky husband, uh, he won't throw a fit when he's having iftar, right? But you need to spit that out after making sure the taste is uh, what you want. Uh, smelling incense and perfumes uh, is also uh, permitted. Ibn Taymiyyah said something that's very beautiful regarding perfume, incense, and kuhul, and, uh, and injections. He said, Siyam is one of the pillars of Islam and was completely clarified by the Prophet ﷺ in details. And these matters are matters that were used and practiced by people very commonly on daily basis. So had they been nullifiers of one's fast, then the Prophet ﷺ would have clarified this to people just like he clarified everything else that nullifies one's fast on different occasions and in different texts. And then he said, Ibn Taymiyyah that is, Rahmatullah Ali, and since we don't have an authentic or an inauthentic narration stating that any of these matters nullify one's fast, then we can safely conclude that these matters do not invalidate one's fast. What is also permitted is to eat and drink and have sexual intercourse from sunset until the crack of dawn. Not the other way around, right? From sunset until the 
just before the crack of dawn. To wake up in the state of ritual impurity, pure impurity. One had sexual intercourse with his wife at night, and uh, he intended to wake up for suhoor, but he overslept, overslept until the adhan. So he woke up in the state of ritual impurity. Then that's no problem. He can go and take a ritual bath, ghusl yani, and uh, resume with his fasting the, the remaining part of the day. And there is no problem with that as per the narration of Aisha radiallahu anha in the book of Imam al-Bukhari and Muslim. This also applies to a woman who uh, just concluded his, her postpartum bleeding or the monthly period uh, and did not take a, a ghusl, a, a ritual bath, until after the, the crack of dawn, then that's also not a problem. What if someone eats and drinks thinking this, that the sun had set? Then there is no problem. Asma radiallahu anha, and this is in the book of Imam Bukhari, she said one day during the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, we ate and drank thinking that the sun had set. There, was, there were clouds in the sky. So we thought, we thought the sun had set, so we ate. And then suddenly the clouds moved and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam did not command us to make up for that day. This means that mistakenly breaking the fast, thinking that the sun had set, and then discovering that it had not set. Now one might argue, well, we have Adhan. What if you're traveling, right? And you're on the road. You're traveling by car, and there are parts where there is no reception in the radio. You don't know, right? And you think, it, well, this can apply even during our times. Things that invalidate one's fast. Intentionally eating and drinking. Now what if someone forgetfully eats and drinks? The Prophet ﷺ said, anyone who eats and drinks whilst forgetting that he is fasting, then it is Allah Azzawajal who gave him food and drink. Let him continue his fast. And this is mentioned uh, by Imam Ibn Majah and Shaykh al-Albani ruled it as authentic. I know a person who was fasting one day but it was a voluntary uh, fast. And uh, he, during lunch hour, this is back in the States, during lunch hour he went to his uh, parents' house and his mom said, son, why don't you sit and eat? So he sat and ate a full meal and drank and then had tea and dessert and then he said, oh mom, you know what? She said, what son? He said, I forgot, I was fasting. She said, SubhanAllah, you ate all of that and you're fasting? You forgot that you're fasting. <laughs> but still, SubhanAllah, it is Allah who gave him this food and drink. Okay, uh, if a woman receives her monthly period or the postpartum bleeding, as we said, even if it was seconds prior to the, the, the sunset, then her fast for that day is invalid and she must make it up. Intentional vomiting. The Prophet ﷺ said, and this is by, uh, reported by Imam Tirmidhi and ruled as authentic by Sheikh al-Albani, narrated by Abu Huraira, he said, anyone who is overcome by vomiting, then he does not need to make up. But if he intentionally vomits, then he needs to make that up. Ejaculation, whether by touching the wife, hugging the wife, kissing the wife, or masturbation, or any physical means uh, invalidates one's fast. But the scholars said, if it's just by looking at one's wife and one ejaculates, then this is just like wet dreams. It does not mandate one to make that up. A dangerous point that invalidates the fast is to intend, even if you don't drink, drink or eat anything. If one Intends, firmly intends. Okay, I'm not going to continue the day. Right? This intention is only known by Allah. Sheikh al munajjid may Allah preserve him, said, that invalidates his fast and he needs to make that day up. There is one action that invalidates the fast and mandates making up as well as an expiation. 
And that is only when one intentionally, willingly, whilst remembering that he's fasting, has intercourse with the spouse. So, intentionally, willingly, so if he's forced to do it, then he's not included. Forgetfully, he's not included. So, intentionally, willingly, remembering that he is fasting. A man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa and this is in the books of Imams al-Bukhari and Muslim, narrated by Abu Hurairah. He said, O oh, Prophet of Allah, I'm destroyed. He said, what did you do? He said, I had intercourse with my spouse during the day whilst fasting in Ramadan. He said, do you have means to free a slave? He said, no. He said, are you strong enough to fast 60 consecutive days non-stop, no interruptions? He said, no, I can't. He said, do you have money to feed 60 poor people? He said, no, I don't. So the Prophet ﷺ remained silent and the man sat. A short while later, the Prophet ﷺ was brought a container of dates. So he said, where is the man who just asked me the question? He said, here I am, O Prophet of Allah ﷺ. He said, take this and go give it to a poor or needy family in Medina. He said, I swear by Allah who has sent you with the truth, I don't think that there is a family in Medina poorer than my family. So the Prophet ﷺ said, then take these dates and feed them to your family. And he laughed Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam until the Sahabi, the companion said, we saw his moral teeth. Out of laughter, he وسلم, was laughing to the situation of this man who violated his siyam but then took food and gave it to his family as a result. Now, is this something that the woman is addressed with too? The expiation? It's different types. First type is a woman who willingly did it with her husband. Then, she's also addressed and she must also expiate. But, if her husband forced her, then the predominant opinion is that she is not addressed with the expiation. She is not to expiate, but only to uh, make up. What if someone is making up for Ramadan? And it's not during Ramadan. And he does that. He doesn't have to expiate, but he must make it up. The order in which one expiates for this uh, violation is the order mentioned in the narration. He must free a slave. If he can't, then he or doesn't find, like in our time now, there are no slaves. Then he must fast 60 consecutive days, non-stop. If he interrupts at day 58, 59, then he must start all over again from day one. Right? So if he goes on, goes on, goes on, holding on, 56, 57, 58, 59, and then breaks a day, then you start count day one, day two, day three, and so on. Difficult. Well, it's a consequence of negligence and given in to the shaitan and to our desires. But that does not include the interruption happening due to the days of Eid because we're commanded not to fast. This does not interrupt the sequence of days or the uh, continuity of the fast. Making up for Ramadan can be done anytime and it doesn't have to be in succession. If someone missed, say, on a travel or a sickness or the ladies for their monthly periods or something, missed three, five, ten days, whatever, he can make it up or she can make it up up until next Sha'ban. Right? As Aisha radiallahu anha used to do. She used to make up in the Sha'ban of the uh, following year, prior to the following Ramadan. And it doesn't have to be all in one go.
Someone who dies and did not fast. What is the condition there? Well, there are two people or two types of people. He did not fast whilst able to fast. And there are two branches to this. Was he excused or was he not excused? If he did not fast, uh, did not make up for the fast, I'm sorry, if he did not make up for his fast whilst able to fast, and had no excuse, then his guardian, and a guardian here is a relative or an ear, uh, needs to feed a poor person as a way of giving charity on his behalf. It's not to make up for these days because he had no excuse. Now, if he, was, if he had a legitimate excuse, then his guardian would feed someone on his uh, behalf. Uh, Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu said, if someone fasts and he owes days of fasting, then let people, meaning his relatives or ears, feed a person, a needy person, for every day he owes. And this is narrated by, uh, reported by Al-Tirmidhi and Shaykh Al-Albani ruled it to be an authentic narration. Someone who didn't fast but was not able to fast during his life. The Prophet ﷺ was approached, and this is narration by Ibn Abbas, reported by Imam Ahmad and Shaykh Al-Abnaut ruled it to be authentic according to the conditions of authenticity of Imams Al-Bukhari and uh, Muslim. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and he said, my mom died and she owed a month of fasting. Should I fast? He said, if she owed money, would you not pay it back? He said, yes. If she was indebted with money. He said, yes, I would pay it back. He said, then the debt of Allah Azza wa is worthier to be paid back. Fast on her behalf. Let me conclude the session with mentioning things that are recommended for a person to do whilst fasting and particularly during Ramadan. As we said, the objective of fasting is to obtain piety. Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu kutiba alaykum usiyamu kama kutiba ala ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. Perhaps that you can attain or achieve piety or Allah consciousness. So anything that serves this purpose, anything that goes in this direction, is encouraged and recommended. Number one is Qur'an. The Prophet ﷺ used to review Qur'an with Jibreel every year, once. Except for the year of his death, he reviewed it twice. And there are too many narrations, too many stories on, uh, about the companions and about the Salaf. May Allah have mercy upon them. How they used to concentrate and focus on the recitation of Quran during Ramadan. Number two, mentioning Allah Azza wa Jal in general. Number three, giving out in charity. Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, and this is mentioned in the book of Imam Bukhari. He said the Prophet ﷺ was the most generous of people. There is no one who was more generous than him in giving out in charity. And he was the most generous during Ramadan. When Jibreel came down to review the Qur'an with him, he would be faster in generosity, meaning in spending, than a blowing wind that continuously blows. Look at the dis beautiful description of the Prophet ﷺ. Charity. Number five. I lost count here. Praying taraweeh. And remaining with the Imam, leading the Salah, until he concludes. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, the result of that is that it would be counted as if you had prayed the entire night. So, if Allah Azza wa Jal decrees and you're passing by, 
and it is time to pray Salatul Isha and Taraweeh, and you can't make it. If you, if you try to go elsewhere, you would lose it. And you happen to be in a masjid where the Imam's voice is not very pleasant. Then tolerate it for the reward for that day. Tolerate it and then look for another masjid or make sure you're near the masjid that you want to pray in the following night. Next is i'tikaf, which is residence in the masjid in seclusion, not in socialization. A lot of people gather and socialize a lot in i'tikaf with the intention of worshiping Allah Azza wa Jal. So when you go to i'tikaf, inshallah, make sure that you don't talk a lot. You don't socialize a lot. You're not there to do that. You can do that at home. You can call your friends. I've, I've been in, in, in an i'tikaf where people had internet and they were actually using the internet during the i'tikaf and, and surfing the net whilst in i'tikaf and calling the wife 300 times and calling all the friends. So what's the purpose of i'tikaf if you're going to be doing everything else that you're doing in life in a normal situation except for what you're supposed to be doing, which is secluding yourself from everything to worship Allah Azza wa Jal. So let us make sure if Allah blesses us and we go in i'tikaf to be in i'tikaf. Another recommended act is performing Umrah during Ramadan for those who can do it, whether yani, they can take time off or they can afford it or cannot afford it, whatever. Because it's equivalent to performing Hajj with the Prophet وسلم, as he said, he said, Umratun fi Ramadan ka hajjatin ma'i. Performing a Umrah during Ramadan is equivalent to performing Hajj with me. Right? Finally, is uh, it is very encouraged and recommended to feed people who are fasting, to give them the fast-breaking meal, which is called iftar al-sa'im. Right? What's the result of that? The Prophet ﷺ said, whoever does that will get the reward of that fasting person without diminishing his reward. So you were fasting that day, and you saw a group of people, and you gave them food. Ten. So you've actually fasted, got, got the reward of fasting ten plus one, eleven days. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal to accept from us, to prolong our lives, to make us reach Ramadan and enable us whilst in Ramadan to perform all different types or acts of worship and make it sincere for the sake of Allah Azza wa Jal and accept them from us and free us from fire because Allah Azza wa Jal during Ramadan every night frees a set group of people of the believers from hellfire we ask Allah Azza wa Jal to make us amongst those who are freed from hellfire during Ramadan. Wa akhiru da'wana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alamin.